Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4220, Abstract Algebra 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In the contents of lecture 17, we want to revisit the idea of the dihedral group, that is the group DN, which we had introduced previously as the symmetries of the regular n-gon, uh, that is an n-sided polygon where all sides and angles are congruent to each other. We'd seen this previously, but much like the other permutation groups, particularly SN that we've seen in this chapter, we want to revisit this and simplify our approach, our understanding to the dihedral group using our more advanced knowledge of, of abstract algebra, if we can even call it that at this time. Uh, be aware that in the past we've studied the groups D3 and D4 extensively. Uh, D3 was, of course, the symmetry group of the equilateral triangle, and D4 is the symmetry group for the, for the square. Now, in general, of course, any um, the DN, for example, is going to be the symmetry group of our regular N-gon. And so let's talk a little bit of what that would look like, right? How, how should we understand this thing? Now, for any, for any N-gon, right, I want you to be aware that this thing can be inscribed inside of a circle whose center coincides with the center of the N-gon here. And so imagine you can see a circle, uh, it's not the best drawn circle. I do apologize for that. But do imagine we have a circle that's drawn and we're going to have the x-axis and y-axis meet at the center of this circle right here. And so what we're going to do is every regular n-gon can be inscribed inside of a circle. Now we're going to choose not just any old circle. We're going to choose the unit circle. Great, we love the unit circle, but we're gonna choose the unit circle in the complex plane. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna associate the vertices of our regular n-gon with complex roots of unity. So we're always gonna position in the following way that since one, the number one, is always a root of unity, we're gonna make sure one is a vertex for our regular n-gon. Then we would take the next vertice to be the principal uh, root of unity, nth root of unity, and then we just continue around the circle taking each and every one of the root, nth roots of unity until we have them all labeled. So in this example, I'll just draw the sixth roots of unity. So we're going to have, for example, one. We're going to have the element which we're going to call zeta six, which beware, this is going to be e to the two pi, two pi i over six, or if you prefer, e to the pi i thirds. Then the next one over here, you would get zeta squared, which would coincide with the next one here. You're gonna get e. We're just going to double the angle now, so you're gonna get two pi i thirds. Uh, then the next one, zeta cubed, that's just the number negative one. Uh, then the next one, zeta to the fourth, this would be e to the two pi, I guess it would be excuse me, it would be uh, 4 pi i over 3. Uh, then the next one, zeta 5, this would be e to the 5 pi i over thirds, over 3. And then, of course, you could get back to 1, which is the same thing as zeta to the 6th, because these, of course, are all 6th roots of unity. So what we can do is we can identify the regular n-gon with this n-gon in the complex plane. That is, we're going to identify the vertices of our polygon with these complex roots of unity. So no, it's not a perfect, uh, it's not by any means a regular hexagon here drawn in the plane, but you know, you'll, you'll give me some leniency here. These, this is the best I can draw for the moment. Um, and so, of course, it always contains the number one. You're going to have your principal roots of unity, uh, which would include zeta and zeta to the five right here. Um, you're also going to have, since it's the sixth roots, you'll have your third roots of unity right here, uh, which would be zeta two and zeta to the fourth. And then you'll have your second root of unity, which is negative one. But so all of those will be the vertices of our of our polygon here. Now we're going to define two specific uh, two specific symmetries of our n-gon, and these will be the this notation we're going to use for every single in a regular n-gon, and hence these will be elements of every single dihedral group. So the first one is going to be based upon rotation. If we're thinking of the symmetries of the regular n-gon, then much like we saw in the previous slide associated to the sixth roots of unity, we can take the angle theta to the 2 pi over n. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to define a map. We're going to call this map R. And R will be rotation around the origin in the complex in the comp complex plane by the angle measure 2 pi over n. And we're going to go counterclockwise. And so with regard to our regular ingon, what this will do is this will take this will take the, the, the vertice of the 1, which of course is on the x-axis, and if you rotate it by one little tick, because uh, 2 pi n will be the smallest angle that moves 1 to the principal in the root of unity. And this will, of course, have the effect that everyone gets moved over, right? So uh, if this is like the first point on our n-gon, then the second point will go to 3, the 3 will go to 4, the 4 goes to 5, the 5 goes to 1, like you can see over here. So be aware that this first this first pentagon is what the original labeling is, and then as everyone moves by one, if you rotate it by a single a single click, and to be precise, that would be a two pi in counterclockwise rotation. We're going to call that one R. All right. The other th the other one we're going to introduce here is we're going to introduce a reflection map, which we're going to call S for which S is going to be reflection across the real axis, or which is identified with the x-axis in the complex plane. And so therefore, if you take, for example, points two and five on this regular ingon, they will swap locations. So two becomes five and five becomes two. And likewise, three and four on this pentagon will swap locations. And so three becomes four and four becomes three. I want to mention that geometrically this, the reason we chose this symmetry is somewhat significant because if we think of the vertices of our ingon as complex roots of unity, then reflection across the horizontal axis, which you'll always have a horizontal axis of reflection, whether you have an even number or odd number of vertices, this, ver this line here will always pass through one of the vertices, the way we oriented the vertex that corresponds to the number one. And if it's an odd number, then this will go through the midpoint of the opposite side. Uh, on the other hand, if it's an even number, then this line, of course, will go through a different vertex over here, which will necessarily correspond to negative one, and it's halfway through all of the roots of unity there. And so geometrically, this, this reflection across the, the real axis will be complex conjugation. So again, there's this geometric and algebraic significance of choosing this as sort of our canonical reflection. Uh, it's going to be complex conjugation. And then, of course, the rotation we mentioned earlier, this is the rotation that sends the number one to the principal in root of unity. So again, there's some significance of choosing these canonical representations, R and S. They're kind of a big deal. Um, we should mention that, of course, reflection uh, is going to be an order two operation here, order two symmetry. If you reflect twice, you get back the original element. Uh, on the other hand, R, so we see that we see that S will be a map, which is order two. Um, R, on the other hand, it's a rotation. And because we chose sort of this minimal rotation, 2 pi over n, we're going to see that this is going to be a rotation of order n. In particular, the cyclic subgroup generated by R is going to form uh, the sub the, the cyclic subgroup of order n right so this is this will give you the rotation sub the rotational subgroup inside of inside of the dihedral group and in fact using notation we introduced previously we can identify this rotational subgroup with zn the group of complex roots of unity which is a cyclic group uh, this rotational this rotational group here can be identified uh, with that those groups of complex numbers here where basically the the angle theta of rotation can be identified I, can be identified with a nth root of unity on the in the complex plane. Now, why do we care about these two maps, these two symmetries specifically, R and S? Well, the thing is, these two maps are going to generate the entire dihedral group. That is, we can say something like the dihedral group Dn is equal to the group R comma S. So notice here, if we just have a single element, we talk about the cyclic subgroup generated by R. What that meant was, of course, the smallest subgroup of the group that contains R. So what we mean here is that R and S, we want the smallest subgroup that contains both R and S. And in the dihedral group, that's going to be the whole group. And we say that these things generate the group. Essentially, we can, we're can we arguing that every, every symmetry in the dihedral group can be written as a product of R's, S's, and their inverses. 
And by comparison, of course, we proved in the previous lecture that SN is generated by the set of transpositions. Uh, that we showed that every permutation can be written as a product of transpositions. So the transpositions uh, form a generating set for the whole group. And so that gives you a little bit of a preview of these maps R and S. In the next video, we'll prove specifically uh, this fact right here. So stay tuned. Um, you should hopefully be able to see the link on the screen right now. Take a look at it if you would like.